Eldon, I've really been looking forward to delving into the ways that brain science can, I suppose, enhance the creative process. So I'm really excited to chat with you today. Gabriella, thank you very much for inviting me on your show. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you and your viewers, your listeners, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Wonderful. Yeah, welcome. I'd love to start, Eldon, with maladaptive behaviours, those habitual responses or those coping mechanisms that can hinder rather than help, and really particularly how they can limit the creative process, often causing procrastination or, or creative blocks. So firstly, perhaps you could define your own understanding of maladaptive behaviour so that we're all in the same space together. So this is a very deep, deep topic that I've studied for over three decades. And we could be doing like a seven day workshop on this, just this particular question. Um, the definition as such is not important, but I think what's important for your viewers and listeners is to understand that um, how the brain works and why we have these maladaptive behaviors. And they're basically um, software and hardware in the brain. So you have the neural pathways in the brain, neural synaptic connections, and the programs operating within the hardware clusters of uh, you know neural connections is automatic and it is subconscious we're not even aware and it's usually um, linked to self-limiting beliefs is linked to childhood traumas and also for maybe this is a surprise for a lot of people when we talk about emotional and psychological trauma is not necessarily just abuse. It could be anything that is interpreted to um, for a child or a young adult as a trauma. But what is particularly interesting is that the brain, certain parts of the brain, they actually get impaired in structure and function because of these emotional traumas and psychological trauma. So now there, there is an adult, an adult is trying to live their life, be creative, do so many wonderful things that they're trying to do. But what they are coming up against is almost like a filter that they perceive the world through. So um, people say like perspective and perception is the same thing, it's actually nothing further from the truth. So there is the perception and then there is a perspective. Perception is actually external, but perspective is uh, you view things as you are through these filters and through these limiting beliefs, through these uh, traumas and through also perhaps you can just label it as the damaged brain because it literally is impaired in structure and function and cannot operate as a person who has a healthy brain or who perhaps has had childhood traumas and then as an adult has healed these uh, parts of the brain so then the brain can actually operate at the optimal level. Yeah, that's really helpful, Alden. First, that explanation that it's happening, as you said, it's happening subconsciously and also the real understanding that there is an impairment. So the brain isn't functioning in the same way as someone who perhaps hasn't had that emotional wounding and doesn't have as a result that perspective that, 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 they're, that they're filtering, that they're seeing. So let's dig a little deeper because it's really great. We've got this understanding that, okay, here I am, I'm a writer something's happened in my past, an experience that's caused some impairment in, in the brain that's now ensuring that I filter my environment in a specific way, which is really impacting my perspective on the world. And that's impacting my creative process. So let's give like a real life example. Let's imagine a writer here with us and you're talking to them and you think, mm, yeah, I'm spotting the way that they're talking, that there's some kind of maladaptive behavior going on. Let's say they're talking about a creative block that they're experiencing. 
What might you hear and what might you notice that makes you think, yes, there's some kind of damage or impairment that's that's happening here? Well, on average, it takes me five minutes to actually, when I have a conversation with either in uh, in a workshop and, you know, you ask somebody as a volunteer to have a chat with you, it takes me an average five minutes to actually unpack their blocks it, or if it's one-on-one -on -one client and it's a particular set of questions so you actually ask them like what is it that they like to to do what is their desire what is their objective if it's a writer and they have an objective to write a, perhaps a first book or to publish another book or have another book published you ask them what is that book that they like to do what does it look like what does it feel like what like what is the finished product and first if they don't have the clear vision of what that looks like that's the first block and the second block could be um, when you ask them what is your writing like process and f in most cases especially people who are writing the very first book they would uh, write and edit simultaneously and that is a no-no and because they have that self-critical kind of uh, voice and, and that's a maladaptive behavior that, that uh, passing judgment literally every word they type every sentence they write they are criticizing and they are evaluating it's going to take them 20 years to write uh, I don't know like uh, two, 20,000 words because they're constantly evaluating, you know, can I do better? I, I actually know people who said, oh, I'm going to publish a book in 2024. Or uh, one guy actually 2023 said, and now it's 2024, halfway over. And he said, you know, Eldon, I've written and rewritten the book 17 times since I made the public announcement that I'm going to release my book in 23." And I am worried. And now I've actually decided to hire an editor. And mm. I, th I said, that's a great idea. But then I asked him, I said, what is the, what do you think is your block? He said, well, I've changed. I evolved as a person, as a human being. So what the version one written, I don't know, like 18 months ago, I'm no longer that person. I've grown. And I said, okay, great. But... If you want to put something, and he said, by the way, there is this nudge within me that I need to write this book because I think there is a book number two within me waiting to come out. I said, well, it's never going to happen because you haven't released the, you know, you're passing judgment, you're criticizing. I said, just write. He said, what do you mean just write? I said, well, thank God for technology today. Before they used to write with like pen and paper. Now we have technology and the, for the viewers and listeners, they probably heard of the one of the greatest um, personal development book authors, Mark Victor Hansen. He he co-authored a Chicken Soup for the Soul book series with Jack Canfield. Mark Victor Hansen is a personal friend and my mentor. So what he said to me, he said, Eldon, don't write one book, write three, write five books simultaneously. And he said, the way you write them, you use the dictaphone or you use one of the devices that you can voice record and then or even perhaps he said voice to text he said don't worry when you get an inspiration you get ideas um, you know it's a novel or it's a, a personal development book he said you just dictate your thoughts and leave it there so you just add in you know by the time you're done with all of this, probably each book will be about 200,000 words because it's all topsy-turvy. Don't worry. And then when you are ready, then you sit down and you decide which chapter goes where. You then edit, you polish, and you maybe end up with fifty to 80,000 words per book. And that's how you do it. And he said, you can write the book in a week. You can write the book in two weeks if you follow this process. So understanding how experts do it. and by the way for those of you who are not familiar with Mark Victor Hansen he has sold 500 million copies of the chicken soup for the soul book series basically he's been several times in the Guinness Book of Records for the the biggest selling 
uh, author for non-fiction books in the world, like the best-selling author. So, and I think it's been translated to, to, to about 54 languages. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. And having him as a mentor is a, is a real blessing. Wonderful. Let's go back to those two examples you gave, because I think they're really spot on, Eldon. You talked about, and I love that you said, you know, give me five minutes and I can tell with somebody. So you said, if I'm asking somebody about their goal for the book and they have no vision. So explain, because we're, we're discussing about a maladaptive behavior. So this is a coping mechanism. Let's go back to the neuroscience. How could not having a vision have be, have be a result of a coping mechanism? Why might not having a vision be someone's way of coping or even a defensive strategy? Because at some point the brain was like, this is a really useful thing to do in this moment, to no longer have vision. So can you tell us about what's going on in the brain when someone might have a creative project, but the brain is sort of saying, let's not have a vision for this. Let's stay safe or let's cope with the situation. Well, it's, uh, it's directly linked to the, the fear responses, their self-worth, their self-love, their passing judgment, their kind of um, habitual behavioral process on um, how they feel about themselves, um, their positive self-image or lack of positive self-image. Um, like last uh, last week, I did a masterclass on um, emotional and psychological self-belief and the neuroscience about it. And, and that's directly linked to that. You see, people, when we talk about the belief, people always, you know, the society links it to something we do, as in your ability to do something. In fact, it's two part. The self-belief is two part and number one is the self-image. It's more important than your belief in your ability. So if you have a strong belief in your ability and you've done the courses, you've been, you've been to school, you've been to university, you did the master's degrees and PhDs and all of that, right? You, you have 20 years career experience, but you have very low um, self-image, your quality of the the outcome of the work will not be as high as if you focus on the elevating your self-image and the self-image is to do with how you feel about yourself what is your inner dialogue what is your inner conversation so you need to yeah. address that as a root cause of your challenges once you have elevated that then you can say, okay, you can improve your belief in your ability. And the way you do it, basically, um, there are many um, modalities that you can use to elevate your um, positive self-image and the belief in your ability. But going back to you as a writer, it's, it's very important to understand that your procrastination and these creative blocks are nothing but um, your inability to actually follow through because you have an unconscious program running in the background. What will they think of me? Will they laugh at me? What will they say? They, my family, my friends, the peers, the, the social media, the strangers. What if I get a negative co comment on Twitter or somewhere or negative review on Amazon or what if this and what if that? So we have all these movies and we haven't even decided that what's the book going to be like as a finished product. And not only that, we, we are not even doing the mental rehearsal. There is a word which goes around and I, I don't like to use it. It's called visualization. But it's actually in neuroscience, it's called mental rehearsal. So your mental rehearsal is... I'm not good enough. I'm never going to sell one copy. Nobody's going to buy my book. This is, by the way, all unconscious. So all mm. of those unconscious programs is actually hindering you and stopping you to move between where you are to where you want to be. And that's why it might be taking you last five years and, you know, to even write something or maybe you've written something and you think it's rubbish and you are rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And 
Like this book behind me, I published in 2019. It took me two years to write my first book. I'm writing five books at the moment. And if you ask me, Eldin, looking at this book and reading it, who you are today, how you are today, would you have written exactly word for word same book? The answer is no. But am I happy that I have written and put it out into the world? I am. So mm. I am not criticizing this book at all. Yes. Could it be greater? Yes. Could it be like a thousand times better? Yes. But when people ask me, what's the most important book in your, in your life? I would say the one I've written, not the one I've read. Because any writer out there who is going through the process of writing, in order for you to write a book, you probably have read hundreds if not thousands of books yourself. So mm -hmm. it means... In order for you to write, you are a reader, right? Yeah. You've read so many books and you're looking at the writing styles and you get inspiration and then you, you know, you have life experiences, maybe you have a career experiences and then you put that on paper and um, it's never going to be perfect because uh, actually there is no perfection. You know, the, the word definition perfection in the dictionary and thesaurus is actually inaccurate the reality is that there is only improvement. There is no perfection mm -hmm. as such. So even when you publish that book, um, a year later, you've grown, you've changed, you improved in so many skill sets and maybe your mindset, your emotional state, your ability to regulate your nervous system. So now you would probably end up writing a slightly different book or completely different. So just do yourself a favor, whatever is within you today, just write that and then write number two and number three. And, you know, it's okay. And by the way, for those of you thinking about in the back of your mind, you know, in that subconscious program, what will they think of me? Trust me, nobody cares. No one cares because they're dominant focus is internally is the shit that goes in their head it's their emotional trauma It's look at me i am the victim their learned helplessness their coping mechanisms about day to day paying my bills dealing with my partner dealing with my children dealing with my business with my boss with my that's their focus they could care less about what you've done you know and so you, you know just do yourself a favor and write that book. It's there's lots of phrases and the way that you say it, Eldin, it's it's really breaking it down to sound very simple. And I want to come back to this idea that I'm a writer, I really want to write this book, and as we started with this question, we've got the we we've got this inability to have that vision of the finished project because as you said I'm completely consumed by the fear of, of what people will think. So let's really come back and sort of come into that moment. So the way that I'm imagining it is I've got this, this neural pathway in my brain and the moment I start to think about the vision for my book, my brain goes, no, because I don't think of myself in a good enough way and I can't imagine anybody thinking that this book is gonna be good and that, that's really scaring me. So the brain sort of says, I'm not going to have a vision for this book. And that's a great way to stop me writing it. And then I'm thinking, oh, but I listened to that amazing podcast with Eldon and he was saying, do yourself a favor. So how do we start to move through that moment where the brain is, is literally putting on the brakes, possibly causing a, tr a trauma response? And I'm, and I'm starting to give myself a hard time because I'm like, why can't I give myself a favor? Yeah. So, yeah, it's basically physiologically the brain and body is experiencing a state of stress, state of fight or flight as if you're being chased by a lion. And this is all self-perpetuated, like literally. And it, it shuts off your immune system. It causes like uh, irregular heartbeat. Now you're, you're breathing out of rhythm. Your heart is beating out of rhythm. Rhythm. You have a scattered brainwave thoughts and it's like, you know, you freeze. Like, okay, that's it. I, I, I don't like to feel like this. I'm going to go do something. I'll come back to this another day. You go, I don't know, like social media, watch something on Netflix, or maybe you binge watch the entire show, uh, first season, second season, 
And yeah, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Then you open a glass, of, a bottle of wine. You have a glass of wine. You go to meet some friends. You do all sorts of things, and you know in the back of your mind, you at some point you have to address this. Well, here's a problem. The root cause is people say affirmations don't work. I guarantee you, you're an expert in affirmations. What I mean, not you, uh, Gabriella, but you know, a person, a writer who is struggling. Because their affirmations are as follows. I'm not good enough. I'm not a great writer. Who am I to write a book? Who will listen to me as so-called expert to write this book? I don't deserve to, like, are you kidding me? So this is their affirmation daily. So when they have the, the, the urge, motivation, they listen to a podcast, Read, read another book, some you know, whatever. Maybe to, they've been to um, a writer's course, how to write and publish a book. By even Mark Victor Hansen teaches those courses. They've been, let's say, to Mark. They've been to Mark's course, and what Mark doesn't teach is that how to remove the blockages which are self-perpetuated. So, literally, you take a pen and paper. And you go like this. You put a line down the middle. On the left, identify all the negative, disempowering, uh, inner conversation, beliefs and thoughts. Well, what is the belief? It's basically just the thought repeated over and over and over again. Basically, you've been affirming these um, thoughts. And this has literally created neural pathways in your brain, which now, that's your operating system. So how do you remove and re rewire the brain to have the new operating system? You On the left, you identify what are the dominant disempowering things that you say to yourself once you get an inspiration and you, I, you begin to feel stressed. You f begin to feel like, no, I can't do this. You become aware. The awareness is step one. Step two mm -hmm. is you replace them. You literally replace them on the right hand <coughs> side of the page. You write all the things in opposition to the disempowering. Now you're writing things. I can do this. And you begin to. So you cannot visualize. I cannot do this. What you can visualize is that I am an amazing writer. I'm a published author, not just a writer. I am a published author. And I have sold. 65,000 copies of my book in the first 12 months and as a result of this book and having sold these many copies, I am interviewed on the radio, on the TV, I am invited as a guest speaker to uh, attend uh, as a keynote speaker and I'm getting paid for my speaking engagements after the first 12 months of having published this book. Now, when you say all of that, you can visualize that. And that should be your mantra. Is it true today? No, because you only written thousand words. But it can be true because as you affirm this constantly, daily, and you couple this with elevated emotion, this begin thanks to neuroplasticity, this begins to create new neural pathways in your brain to look like the event has already happened and now you are changing the biology and physiology to look like you are already that person today. And it's inevitable. It's not if it's going to happen, it's just a matter of when. Mm. Mm, so juicy. I, wanna, I, I want to really take a moment to pause where you said, Eldon, this this phrase that people say, oh, affirmations don't work, because I, I've heard that a lot too. But the way that you said you're you're making your affirmations work every day, you're just waking you making your negative affirmations work. So actually people watching this can all already do a check in their lives. Like what isn't happening and how does that correlate to that negative inner chatter? So you're saying, right, make a list, all the affirmations that are currently working that you don't want to be working, so those kind of negative affirmations, and then switching it to the more positive affirmations, the ones that you want to happen. I want to hone in 
on the phrase elevated emotion because this is something that I experienced when I first began my development journey I would have that vision but the emotion that accompanied that vision was a heavy feeling it would never happen so I was that's essentially what I was creating I was holding up this vision with a feeling of like mm, but it's not going to happen to me and I know that I'm not alone in that experience. So I'd love to hear, again, let's say someone puts up their hand in one of your wonderful workshops and says, Eldon, I've got the vision, but I can't seem to get that elevated emotion. Whenever I see my book selling 65,000 copies in the first year, I feel, I feel heavy. I feel like it just won't happen to me. What do I do? Okay, so you know how I said take a pen and paper on the left you identify so there, there are three things you actually have to identify so one is the thought process you become aware of what are you thinking what is your daily dominant disempowering thought or thoughts the number two is daily dominant disempowering emotions and feelings and number three daily dominant disempowering behaviors so you have to do all three Right. And why all three? Because all three create a personality. That's how personality is created. And what is the personality? It's how you think, how you feel and how you behave. And your personality is literally creating your personal reality, which equals your life. So your external experience, you not being able to write the book, you feeling upset, you feeling fearful, you feeling you know, like you're not good enough and, and, you know, you are not seeing the desired outcomes that you've been trying to see in the last five, ten years. You've read all the books, attended all the seminars, you even been to see Tony Robbins and people like that and, and none of it works and I paid for a coach and I paid for this and, well, because you are still operating from the old set of programs and you literally are operating uh, in the life like sort of memories of the past unconsciously living in the memories of the past known experiences putting them into the present and projecting them into the future this is all unconscious but the, what you actually do desire is a completely different experience so you are constantly mentally rehearsing like if I ask you where are you gonna be five years from now I know exactly where I'm gonna be because I've had experiences for the last 15 years and I told you so and I told you so and I told you so basically projecting into the future so how do you pattern interrupt this you interrupt it by a identify these negative disempowering thoughts replace them next identify daily dominant disempowering feelings and emotions replace them and also the behaviors Again, all three you identify without passing judgment. Now that you know, you cannot not know. And basically, you've got to be like alert in the present moment. Practice mindfulness to catch yourself not to go unconscious into the old programs. And as you are being aware, and each time you catch yourself, do you go unconscious and you say something negative about yourself? You express negative emotions about yourself. You act a negative behavior, negative action. Each time you catch yourself is a victory. And those victories add up. And as you are catching yourself, now all those victories are creating new neurosynaptic connections in the brain, new neural pathways. And you are creating new programs. And within some time, you will, these will become automatic. And um, according to University College London, a study from 2017, 2018, they said it takes, uh, they, they actually did an extensive study on habit creation in the brain, uh, positive habits, right? And they said it takes on average 66 days for a positive habit to become automatic. But they said, it depends on the traumas and self-limiting beliefs and all these other things. Per individual, it could take anywhere from two weeks to 268 days. So daily <clears throat> or consistent application is the key. As an adult, because of the neuroplasticity, brain is malleable. Regardless of your traumas, regardless of your age, you could be 40, 60, 95 the brain can actually create new neurosynaptic connections and 
learn new positive habits, regardless of your age. And thank God to neuroplasticity. And actually, neuroscience only discovered this about 15 years ago. Up until that po point, you know, there was a belief you cannot teach the dog, uh, old dog new tricks. And it's a lie, you know. Yeah. And so it's, a, it's incredible what science has discovered and, and, and people are utilizing daily. That's why, you know, like uh, I mentioned, mental rehearsal and for, for audience, if they don't understand what that means. You know, sports people, they do mental rehearsal of each um, step, like sequence of complex steps they do mentally as well as physically. But when they get plugged into brain scan and heart monitors, the scientists, they discover that their physiology and their muscles get activated in the same way when they mentally rehearse as if they are practicing physically and they burn in calories while they're lying on bed or seated in a comfortable armchair. So if you, you are doing that actually, you are an expert in mental rehearsal, Mr. and Mrs. Writer, but if you do it in a positive way and you begin to see the new vision of your future, of you selling 30,000 copies, of you speaking on TV, on radio, and you getting invited to be a keynote speaker, and you getting in attendance like 500 people and attend your workshops and you travel around the world and you are teaching uh, workshops and retreats and all of that why not mm -hmm. do you see what i'm trying to say but you can only yeah. do that if you see that vision and you mentally rehearse as if it's already happened and what is the elevated emotion if you have already achieved all of those desires right here right now today how would you feel you would celebrate, you would feel grateful, right? You would be like, it's done. I have nothing to worry about. And it's not, you know, like people set goals. I will be healthy. I will be a writer. That, that is a rubbish uh, way to set the goal. Because you will always, I will be. And that mm -hmm. I will be will never arrive. I am. Mm -hmm. Even you can do another one. There is another version um, you write a script as if you're telling someone, you know, like you've been on holiday, right? So you, you come home and you, you know, meet your best friend or your partner and, and they say, um, how's your holiday? So now you're telling them how holiday went. So in the past tense, you're discussing about the experience. That's even better. So you can tell a story, write a script and then affirm it, record yourself on a video, record yourself as audio, put the earphones and you listen to yourself telling a past tense story like, oh yeah, I've, I've sold 30,000 copies and I've been invited, I got paid 2,000 pounds to do one hour keynote presentation in this company. And I traveled to America and I did a retreat with 200 people and it was amazing and I met, met amazing friends. And by the way, I was single, but now I'm in love and I found the love of my life across the pond. Imagine. So now you can mentally rehearse this. How would you feel every single day? Exactly. So you yeah. see the difference between the old version of like the memories of the past and mentally rehearsing that unconsciously and then consciously deliberately choosing how to create the pathways in your brain how to experience the world because we are the creators and co-creators every single word every single thought every single emotion carries information so what information are you transmitting this is beautiful, Alden, and I want to I want to touch on the whole idea of being conscious and the mindfulness. But before we go there, and I've made a note that I want to go there, I want to just briefly go back on what you said about personality, because I really want people to take notice of this. So let's create a scenario because I hear this a lot. I might hear a writer say, um, oh, I'm just not the kind of person who has goals or I'm just the kind of person who really struggles with rejection or I'm the kind of person who starts something but just never finishes. So what I'm hearing them say is really sort of 
defining their personality in accordance to their maladaptive behavior. So I'm seeing coping mechanisms and maladaptive behavior being described as personality. Yeah. So how can you help someone who's like, but that is me. I am someone who doesn't finish a project. You know, I'm, I'm hearing the voice in my head that says, you're never going to go anywhere. And it, it feels like me. It just seems so bizarre to imagine that there's a personality that I haven't even seen yet. So, so what you are saying, I, I love this question. So, um, and this is me. So why do you identify something you do as you? Like, like first and foremost, is your, your doing, well, first, is, is your job you? Is your profession you? Is it something you do you? Is it uh, perhaps a condition that you've been diagnosed with you? Is it, um, I don't know, like, um, I'm anxious. It has a different impact on your biology and physiology and your brain and your emotional state and your nervous system. If you say, I experience the emotion of anxiety when I am in these kind of situations, you no longer identify as the anxiety. You are saying the correct way what, you, what is happening with you and with the emotions because you are becoming aware because it's not you. So mm. even to say that I am not this and I am not that, that, that is actually uh, false. It's not, mm. you, you, know, you are lying to yourself. So, so when you say certain things, it's called cognitive reframing. That's in neuroscience. That's mm. what, we, what we call it. So the way you do it, you say, I am not good at this. Um, you say, okay. Look for evidence. Is it true? And if you believe it's true, why is it true? You know? Why what you say you believe is the truth and nothing but the truth? In most cases, I would say 99% of the time, it's a lie. Hmm. If you reframe it, if you, you know, cognitively reframe this into, okay, I have never tried it, but if I try, I know I'm not going to be very good at it at first. But with practice and understanding how the brain works, I'm going to begin to create new pathways in the brain. And eventually, according to University College London, it might take 66 days, it might take three to six months, but it means the daily and consistent application will get me there. So what do I need to do? I need to do reps, I need to do repetition. It's like, that's what I need to do. So everything outside of I, it's a skill set. It's a learned, potential learned skill set. It's not something that you are, who and what you are, it's separate of what you do. Mm. You know? And so when you yeah. say, I can learn this, thank God f to neuroplasticity and how the brain works, I can actually... Um, even heal the parts of the brain which are responsible for emotional regulation and uh, regulating my nervous system because you see stress and being in a state of fight or flight uh, releasing certain chemicals cortisol and adrenaline these uh, stress hormones are highly addictive even more addictive than drugs and alcohol so if a person knows that this is how you know the body is a subconscious mind not the brain it's the body. So now the body is like a, like a wild animal, craves these cocktail of chemicals once you begin to change. It's going to be very challenging because if you're going to be coming up against yourself, you, you know, and you took a pen and paper, you identified the disempowering thoughts, um, emotions and behaviors, and as you try to replace them with the positive ones, the beneficial ones that serve you, you're going to be experiencing some resistance because your subconscious mind is going to say, wait a minute, it's 9 a.m., you usually are in traffic at 9 a.m., 
or on a tube, on the underground, on the metro, and you're giving everybody a finger, you argue and you are elbowing people, looking for your space, because somebody put their armpit in your nose, and, you know, and, and you are experiencing that. And now you are not doing that, you are at home, sitting in your comfortable armchair, and you are meditating. And now the body is saying, I need my coffee, I need my bathroom, I need to check my emails, how long is this going to take? I'm not doing this right. I don't know how to meditate. I cannot stop thinking. This is rubbish. This doesn't work. So you're having all of that. So if you become aware of that, I'm telling you, you're doing, you're doing it correctly. Because mm. the first step in change is even with your eyes closed, you are identifying how many shit thoughts and emotions you have within you, which are dominant, dominant behavioral patterns. And these patterns... Uh, what is creating your life basically your external experiences are down to all of these habitual patterns which you are not even aware so mm. sitting in silence and doing some introspection you know thyself and as you begin to know thyself this is going to help you with your creative process this is going to help you with writing a book yeah, beautiful. And also you've started to weave in that mindfulness piece as well. I want to go back, Eldon. You you said this, you know thyself. And also earlier you were talking about, you know, why do you identify with the version of you that, that can't finish something or is, isn't good enough? What occurred to me as I was listening to you, and this is this is an area that I found as I really began my healing journey, that negative vision of myself was all I had. So it was all I had to identify with. So if I wasn't identifying with that, I was sort of like, oh, <laughs> there's nothing else there. So I sort of wanted to add that in for those people who are like, I've got nothing else to identify with. What I started with was actually, I'm learning to discover who I truly am. I didn't actually know at the time, like the true, version the knowing of thyself but i just kind of held a space for that brilliant creative talented woman to slowly reveal herself to me versus oh well because she's not there i, I must be a piece of shit mm. so i'd love for you to talk to that sort of just holding the space if the truth or the or the real version of ourself isn't there immediately to you know, what would you say to that, that sort of just sitting and waiting and holding space, sort of inviting in that version? Um, I lost you for like uh, maybe five seconds, it froze. Um, but yes, I, I, I understand what you are saying. So what do you say to, to, to yourself as you are trying to... Um, you know, do the healing process, transformation process, so you can remove these blocks and these disempowering patterns. What do you say to yourself? Well, first of all, do not pass judgment. Be kind to yourself. Mm. Number one. That's, that's number one. So you couldn't have changed anything because you were not aware. You actually, literally, were operating from the set of these disempowering negative uh, programs that... Quite few of them, some scientists believe between 85 to 90 percent, they're not even yours. They come from your parents and maybe even passed down through generations. Mm. So they don't even belong to you. So you just accepted them as your truth because you didn't know any better. And also it, it, it is a lot to do with also whether your uh, love language was met as a child, whether the two um, basic human needs, the uh, love and acceptance was met in your perceived way, right? And, and, and just f so people can understand, when humans are born as a child, on average, each child is born with close to 100% self-worth, self-confidence and self-love. This is why you see a baby toddler just starts to walk like 18 months old they their belly is like big and they are in this like swimming trunks whatever like swimming bikinis and they're by the swimming pool and it's like like you know dimples everywhere and they're like look at me mommy look at me daddy they could care less right 
they, they love themselves so much. Now, that person is still there when you are 40, 50, 60. But if you haven't done the healing where things got diluted from that 100% because of the emotional and psychological trauma, because of installation of these negative disempowering programs and beliefs from your parents and you know society and all of that, that becomes diluted, that 100%, if you are lucky by age 20, 25 to maybe 50%, to some people, it's even only 10, 15 percent, and they, they they call it they're so messed up. They're not messed up. It's just a set of programs. So mm -hmm. nothing wrong with you. You might have tried self harm. You maybe had suicidal thoughts. I have actually have an organization that I am co-founder called Save Lives Project. We've been running it. It's a non for profit for the last five years with a couple of other people, and we we help people prevent suicide for the you know all around the world. So, if you had all of that, it's nothing wrong with you. You didn't do anything wrong. It's just a set of programs. And if it's a set of programs, you can literally, like according to computer science, you know, uh, crap in, crap out. You know, like you have a faulty software. So, you know, you buy a new machine. It, it, back in the day, it didn't come with any software. And you have to install the windows, you have to... So maybe if you bought a second hand, which that's what it is from childhood into adulthood, you have a second hand computer with already some software. So now you're like, okay, I no longer need this. This is out of date. I'm going to delete the software and I'm going to install new software. It's going to take some time, especially the old fashioned computers. It took like a whole day to install like one, one software. So... It's going to take you maybe a year to install a new software. So that's all it is. It's actually very, very, very simple. If you understand, there is a formula. So if you follow the formula, you can actually do it. And I want to tell a personal story. So I've been doing this for over three decades as a neuroscientist, as a, as a coach, as a, as a speaker, as an author. But um, in 20, uh, 2009, I suffered psychological and emotional trauma which um, you know I almost died I was in hospital and it was a combination of emotional psychological trauma and also me wanting to kill myself from drinking like bottles and bottles of wine and spirits every single day because I did not want to live I even took some pills and um, me knowing most of the things I still know today it's because you see it was a shock to my system because I found out that my partner at that time, she had a five-year affair and she gave birth to a child which was not my biological son. So I nurtured and raised this baby for two years. I was a proud father of two, thinking, oh my God, this second, second son, my first son was like 10 at that time and the second one is two. I was so happy. And then I find out... Um, through contracting some STIs that um, my partner is sleeping around and, and you know, that broke me. And, you know, I had a detective, I found out everything, then in and out of court, losing the money, losing the house, even though I didn't do anything wrong. And, you know, all of that. So what saved me is what I know, number one. Number two, I had coaches and mentors in my life who actually literally shook me physically what the heck are you doing you know all of these things stop feeling sorry for yourself so i stopped drinking like cold turkey i went back to exercise i um went continued with coaching and mentors and i went actually i went to india and i lived with monks for three months because i needed a lot of deep healing and even after that i didn't heal completely i went back to dating and uh, because my self-love and self-worth was impaired and actually structures and functions of my brain were impaired because of this trauma and now i went and dated a couple of relationships which were all also very negative and um, actually scarred me emotionally even further after the 20 2009 only to the point where in 2014 i met my wife today um, we've been together 10, 10 plus years and we have a two and a half year old son. So happy ending. 
But before I met my wife, I spent one year celibate, living literally for six months with monks. And also when I was back in London, living as a monk, because I knew that I need to heal. And what does a healing look like when I can talk about the past traumas without the emotional charge? And not only that, I had elevated emotions 24-7. I felt so much unconditional self-love that I felt like I don't need anyone. I don't need a woman. I don't need a partner. I'm happy. I don't need the money. I don't need the business. Business was like, was money was coming from so many different avenues. Like, you know, like I would just be sitting and money literally falling from the tree. Obviously, I, was, I have several businesses. And, but my state, my inner state was creating all these experiences. And then I met my wife, who is a mirror version of me, like a, I would say a female version of who I am and how I am. She has so much self-love and self-worth and she did the healing as well from dysfunctional relationship. So you got to do the process. So not only that I know academically how things work and what to do, I also had experienced them on myself and within my own life. And, um, and do I still have certain teething problems today? Yes, very recently, I tell you. So I live with my wife and my two and a half year old son and um, I developed certain uh, skin irritations on my face and on my lips which are symptoms of allergy, food allergy. I've never been, I've never been sick in over 30 years. Like, you know, what doctors say sick except, you know, that emotional stuff in 2009. Um, so I was like, oh my God, what am I going to eat? So... I, as, a, as a guy, I don't want to go see a doctor, so I was avoiding, I was using like natural remedies, you know, lip balms and things for my lips. But my lips would swell up. I eat this, they swell up. But, you know, it was kind of mild allergies, if you will. Only that I went to see a doctor in Harley Street, you know, private doctor in, in central London. I got tested for allergies, the prick test. Everything came negative. Now, he took blood for some other allergies. I have to wait a few days. And he gave me like a cream. So my face is a lot better than what it was yesterday. It was swollen. And day before, I, I, I was almost about to cancel this. I woke up this morning. I said, my face is, you know, is 99% is there. So there's a bit of redness, but it's fine. And why am I mentioning this is because during my last this started to these symptoms develop beginning of April. So I've been living with these symptoms um, severity varied over the last three months. So what I was experiencing, and I was aware of this, is I was experiencing sadness, annoyance, worry. I was experiencing some of the negative emotions which I normally don't experience. I was still practicing meditation and all the positive things that I practice to live the life on purpose, to live as a creator and co-creator, to experience miracles in my life every single day. And I was still experiencing those things in most of the areas of my life, except in the number one most important relationship, which is with my wife. Because of the underlying emotion, I would sometimes say something to my wife, not um, like to attack her or criticize, but I was use a tonality. Like I would say to my wife, can you um, fill up this kettle for me? Because she was at the sink in the kitchen. And I'm assuming she's going to fill it up for like a cup of tea, right? One cup. She filled it up to the rim to like, you, there's not one drop further you can put. So now in the, in the annoying to tone of voice, I said, why did you fill it up so much? And she's like, she got offended. But then I just spilled some and I boiled the kettle and I made myself a tea. And the day before or two days prior, I was like, why did you wash the stuff in the dishwasher? Some of it was already washed. It was double washed. It's not what I said. See, I, I, didn't, I didn't attack my wife. didn't call her names. Didn't, we don't do those things, by the way. We, we speak with respect, with love, and we are always polite and kind. But... 
my tonality changed and that offended my wife and she said you know what i had enough this wasn't a fair it was just a single occasion fine i let it slide but this has been happening last few days and this was like like literally close to my uh, test to go see a doctor on monday yesterday so um maybe unconsciously i was fearful what the results will say what will the the the, the allergy test say i have severe allergies oh my god i'm i'm projecting into the future i'm panicking i will not be able to eat anything oh my god we're going to die abandon ship and as a result some of these emotions they they were seeping to the top right and the person that i loved the most in the world unconditionally she was experiencing that so i caught myself so many times in the last four weeks but i did not catch myself in the last few days and um, things didn't escalate i uh, i just walked out of the kitchen i i fixed myself my inner state my emotional state and and i said okay darling i'm here to listen to what you have to say and first of all i want to apologize but i want to give you space for you to express how you feel so my wife expressed how she feels she said da 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 all the list you know you said at this time you said this and this is how you said it da, da. i'm just listening i said i understand thank you for sharing i'm sorry i expressed my sincere apology and things have never happened since i apologized but then i did say to my wife i got to say this i said maybe it's my fault i should have days ago maybe weeks ago said to you that i have these emotions within me bubbling that are not normal for me because i am normally in the perpetual state of inner peace and homeostasis which is our default state the emotions of unconditional love joy gratitude appreciation those elevated emotions which is our default state as humans so i do not experience these 24/7 because i wake up in the morning i have a flare up of my skin allergies whatever it is i don't know yet and uh, so it's very annoying I, i just want like my life to go back to normal so i don't have these problems you know this conditions whatever it is so um and it's it's also painful or it was no longer is mm -hmm. and so i couldn't open my mouth i couldn't eat my my i would open a mouth to laugh my lips would start bleeding because mm -hmm. they would be like so dry and and, mm -hmm. and cracked and chuffed and whatever so all of that created something within me which i caught most of the time but some of the things slipped through so why i'm mentioning all of this is that it is important for each and every one of us to introspect and pay attention because highly likely because of my training things didn't escalate but if a person didn't have my training this could escalate into severe arguments and fights with your spouse with your children could impair the quality of your work at work and in your business could uh, impair quality of your friendship and all sorts of things could impact your mental and physical health you wouldn't feel like getting out of bed because of these emotions right but you know it, it's very interesting how humans are and uh, how we can go into downward spiral if we are not aware yeah. such a powerful example elden i really want to thank you for giving that real life story because i think it really helps people understand such a powerful example of how that inner state is going to start impacting that external environment in a negative way and what it makes me think of actually earlier the way that you were talking about the brain as a piece of computer software like if our computer is running slowly or programs aren't loading we can immediately say oh there's a problem with my computer because we know we know how it runs when it's running in that place of unconditional love but if we don't have that point of reference as you do so you're able to say hang on a second this isn't like me there must be a little you know there must be an update that needs to happen i need to restart reboot my computer 
But if we don't have that point of reference, we just go, well, this is it. My computer this always runs. This, this, this yeah, is this always is me. me. Yeah. So that's that mindfulness piece that you were touching on earlier, that we've got to have that ability to have that point of reference. So thank you for sharing that because it's such a powerful example. Yeah, because, you know, I, I think it's important, it's relatable as well for the audience to, to understand. <clears throat> I'm just a human being who has had life challenges and curveballs thrown at me, sometimes several at the same time. And it's not what you do with the... Uh, the challenges that the life throws at you is is uh, is how you experience them, how you process them. You know, because uh, mm. most of them actually are there to teach you something, rather than um, you know why is this happening to me. You know, you got to ch reframe that and say, what have I got to learn from this? Yeah, lovely, Elson. I want to finish. We've. We've had such a meaty discussion today. It's been so brilliant. Thank you for going on those deep dives in those areas. And I know that people will have really got a bigger picture about what's happening with these behaviours. I know that in some of your content, you've shared that the hardest part about change is not making the same choices today as you did yesterday. And what that makes me think of is, Okay, that is hard, but also it makes me realize that as long as we make a different choice than we did yesterday, we can start to change. So I'd love for you to share like a really simple way that someone can focus their brain, having watched this interview, to just start making one different choice. Yeah. So the question always comes up is like, how do you do it? Well, I already explained a very important technique, which is pen and paper identify disempowering thoughts, uh, emotions and behaviors. And the, the, the missing part to that technique is if you don't know what to write, close your eyes for a few moments. You like get a pen and paper next to you, sit comfortably on the edge of your couch or edge of your bed in a, in a comfortable armchair, lie down, whatever you know makes you feel comfortable. Make sure you don't fall asleep because you are doing the introspection, pain, being aware as in like... Uh, the thought is like a cloud. You don't, A, number one, it's um, not the truth. Whatever the thought comes to you, A, it's not the truth, and B, you don't have to do anything about it. You are not being urged to take action from that thought. And it's probably a shit thought you've had for three decades. You know? So you're just there for the purpose of, as an observer, to identify, to take data. And then you open your eyes and you write it down. Then same with the emotions, same with behaviors. And it, you might need a few days to identify which are uh, dominant ones, which are repetitive ones. And once you identify, this is a very useful data. Yeah. And then you say, what are the thoughts, emotions and behaviors that no longer serve me moving forward? to become the person that I desire to become, because I see these are the stumbling blocks which were the obstacle for me to move from where I am to where I want to be. So I literally have been the causation of my dysfunctional relationship, finances, life, happiness, inner peace. It's I, not they, not them, right? So. Number one, responsible, responsibility. It's not, some people say it's a bad word. No, it's actually a greatest word. Once you feel that you are responsible, mean, means that you have the power to change your life. You, are, you feel self-empowered. You're like, amazing. So it's a system, it's a process. I can begin something. And what can I do day one? As I described the technique with identifying and writing down. Number two, you say, okay, you know, I heard of affirmations, positive affirmations, meditation, physical exercise, journaling, uh, all of these things. So it might, it, it, I'm going to need an hour a day. Oh, my God, I don't have an hour. So uh, Monday to Friday, I don't have an hour, but I can do it on a Saturday. And I say, no, no. Gratitude is not practiced on a Friday evening. Like, Friday is my gratitude day. no. Every day should be your gratitude day. Every day, especially because how the brain works, 
Um, brainwave state is in theta, which is the door open to your subconscious mind. You can reprogram and rewire the brain faster. Last thing before you sleep and first thing as you wake up. So if you can't afford an hour, you say 10 minutes. So, okay, I'm going to do three minutes of writing three things I'm grateful for and not repeating like a parrot, but I'm evoking the emotions of the things that I'm writing. You really feel in every cell of your being that you are grateful for those things. I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful for my perfect health. I'm grateful for my amazing home, my children, my partner, my whatever, you know? And so three minutes. Next thing you do, I don't know, um, 20 push-ups. There's your physical activity. Next thing, three minutes or four minutes of meditation or some breath work, breathing techniques. You prime yourself for the day. That's it. You, this, this is why you do it. You're priming yourself how you're going to be, how you're going to show up that day. That's what you are doing. That's why you are, you are doing it. And most people, this is very crucial for most viewers and listeners. Most people, I would say 99% of people, before they go to sleep, they think about their problems and they go to sleep in the negative juices of worry, of anxiety, of problems, of who did wrong to whom that day, who is responsible, I hate this and I hate that. And now they marinate and ruminate in those negative juices for six to eight hours. And they wake up in the morning wondering, why am I so unhappy? Why can't, be, why can't I be happy? Why do I have this chronic condition, which is in the low vibrational state? I mean, this is all real. It's not like some woo-woo stuff. Low energy, low vibration is the chronic condition causation because when you are in low vibration, low energetic state, you are in a state of perpetual state of stress, you are shutting off your immune system completely, it doesn't work. So the 99% of doctor's visit, clinic visit, hospital visit are down to, um, all the chronic conditions are down to emotional and psychological stress. This includes me. So whatever was with my skin on my face is something that I don't know, I have not paid attention. Something sipped through and yes, the doctor gave me some kind of ointment for my skin, my lips and my face. I applied it twice yesterday and today. It's already better. Like like, like my friends saw me, my wife saw me. They're like, oh my God, it's like completely different. Like, like how you usually are. But I think it's a combination of the cream and my relief of I haven't got allergies, my relief that is nothing wrong with me. So now I'm in the state of inner peace and homeostasis and now I'm allowing my innate capacity for body, which is the miraculous machine, to do what the body needs to do to heal itself and to take care of itself. That's our innate capacity. So I actually, I was in the way probably all these weeks, you know, even knowing what I know, I was doing that to myself. So I, I, not only that I'm telling you scientifically, I already also know from my personal experience. So I would have probably healed six weeks ago if I didn't do certain things that I did to myself. Mm. So just yeah. to, just to um, continue on what I was saying, the point, if you don't have an hour, do 10 minutes. 10 minutes. If you don't have two hours... Do five minutes in the morning, five minutes before you sleep. And mm -hmm. instead of ruminating and marinating in the state of worry, depression, anxiety, negative, thinking about your problems and projecting into the future the worst case scenario, count your blessings. Deliberately and intentionally focus on what went great that day. What you are grateful for and fall asleep in those juices. And soon enough, as you, you are rewiring the brain to be happy all the time, now it's going to become effortless. And all of a sudden, you have a happy life. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Alden. Thank you for bringing your neuroscience knowledge to the conversation today. Thank you for bringing your energy and your authentic, vulnerable sharing. It's been really lovely to talk with you. Thank you so much, Gabriella. I'm so honored to be on your show. 
and um, I'm happy for your viewers and listeners to have experienced this audio, this video, and I do actually recommend that they do a heavy note taking from the beginning of this show because um, you see there is a expression knowledge is power actually that is not the truth knowledge is, knowledge is only potential power knowledge plus application could be very very useful and very powerful in your life so i highly recommend that you take notes and whatever resonates with you that you can pick and say well i can use this in my life i can use this in my life then you actually begin to take action on the things that you think is useful for you and uh, then share with others as well and uh, to help the algorithm with Gabriella's show wherever it is uh, leave a put a like review share with other people and if you are on I think um, iTunes Apple podcast if you leave a review that helps with the algorithm if you subscribe on Spotify on YouTube that helps with the algorithm because um, these conversations can actually save somebody's life and um, they can help transform somebody's life, their health, their well-being. And um, I think uh, more and more people need to be involved in these kind of conversations. And, and also, if you follow me on social media, which is at Eldin Hassa everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, if you are listening or viewing this podcast, take a screenshot and then tag me in a post on Instagram story or Instagram post or Facebook uh, or LinkedIn. And when you tag me in, then Gabriella and I will know, uh, tag Gabriella as well. And then we can share some free gifts with you, uh, the audience. And um, if you want to know more about my services, it's all over my social media as well as uh, on my website, eldinhassa.co.uk or .com. And uh, my book you can find on Amazon and all good uh, bookstores. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing all of you on social media. Say hi to me if you have seen this uh, podcast or listened to this podcast. And as we are creating the community of people, because um, I think no one can do this alone. And uh, both Gabriella and I, we are on a mission to serve humanity and knowing you as a community what your challenges are and how we can help you further with your journey will really uh, benefit us in so many ways because we are uh, fulfilling our life's mission so thank you so much viewers and listeners and thank you gabriella oh thank you eldon and we'll put all of those juicy links below so people can come and find you thank you so much absolute pleasure